If you would like to uh, proceed, uh, we would welcome your testimony. Madam Chair, thank you uh, very much. It's uh, disappointing to me that uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Senator Coons, is not available for us to do this jointly, and I uh, probably will not be here for his testimony, but he has been a great ally on an issue that uh, he and I both are uh, excited about and wanted to visit with the committee about today. Uh, this is the first time, I think, in the two and a half years I've been a member of the United States Senate that I've testified in front of a committee, and I was not intimidated, no offense to either one of you, ranking member or chairman, slightly when my colleague from Colorado, the, Chairman Bennett walked in. I became a bit more nervous, but then when you introduced that uh, Senator Warner was seated behind me, uh, now I am uh, a little bit more nervous than I had hoped. Uh, there are standards that I wish we all could, uh, could meet, and Senator Warner certainly exemplifies those. Um, the United States is experiencing a resurgence, and uh, Senator Cornyn indicated about the, the, what's happening in the private sector. But we are seeing a real resurgence in the domestic energy, uh, in innovation, and in exploration, and in production. Uh, with, this growth, uh, with this growth, more Americans all the time are employed in the development of our country's natural resources, both traditional and renewable. Our country does much of its energy policy in the tax code. So while many of us will spend time trying to develop what we call energy policy, the reality is that what this committee, what the Finance Committee does, how the tax code looks in many ways determines what our energy policy is. So I'm pleased that uh, this committee and this subcommittee are pursuing this topic. As our technologies mature and uh, our knowledge advances, our tax code has not adjusted to the needs of today's markets. Uh, as Congress considers the future tax treatment in the energy sector, uh, there appears to be a bipartisan consensus, and that is a sound financial tool that has allowed the oil and gas industry to efficiently raise more than $450 billion over the past two decades from a broad array of individuals and institutions. And that tool is the Master Limited Partnership, structure that was introduced in 1987 in Section 7704 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, in my view, uh, it should be uh, renewed, continued, uh, and in my view, it should be modernized to include renewable and clean energy sources. Uh, the MLP is a what I would describe as a publicly traded partnership that holds energy or other specified uh, assets. Traded on public stock exchanges, MLPs allow individuals and small institutional investors to invest in energy projects similar to the way that a mutual fund allows investors to make small investments in diversified stock portfolios. MLPs are efficient structures for raising capital in part because, unlike corporations, the taxable income and deductions are passed through directly to the investors, the limited partners, rather than being taxed twice, once at the corporate level and then again at the shareholder level. This feature of MLPs has enabled the oil and gas industry to raise capital efficiently and at an appropriate cost that has provided investors with sustained and consistent cash flow. Uh, important to note that MLPs, in my view, don't represent what I would call a tax break for individual, uh, for those who are in, uh, industries that are eligible for MLP structures, it's not a tax break. Rather, it is a tax simplification structure that concentrates tax at the investor level, avoids double taxation, and significantly broadens the potential investor base. MLPs have aided in the construction and operation of much of our modern oil and gas infrastructure and most recently fueled the shale revolution in oil and gas. In 2012 alone, MLPs raised over $23 billion of new capital for eligible projects. These include significant parts of the oil and gas supply chain, such as production, pipelines, refineries, gathering and storage facilities. MLPs create needed investment opportunities for individual savings for retirement and for pension funds. And according to the National Association of Publicly Traded Partnership, their survey, 75% of investors in MLPs are over the age of 50. This is in part due to the fact that these individuals are seeking secure income-oriented investments that provide a reasonable return. MLPs fulfill this role where other types of investments will fall short. And this, perhaps, is the most important as we have those who struggle to pay their utility bills. MLPs lower the cost of energy. MLPs afford the energy industry stable access to less expensive capital and therefore lowers the cost of energy to consumers. 
While it's critical that MLPs continue to be available to investments in the non-renewable energy industry, it is also important that we extend this tax structure to the broader energy sector. For example, companies involved in the production of solar, wind, geothermal, combined heat and power are largest renewable energy industries. They've never been eligible for MLP treatment, even though renewable energy has been burdened by the same high cost of capital and the non as the non-renewable energy industry. Only a small group of investors consisting mostly, almost entirely, of a few large corporations have, have been able to invest profitably in re renewable energy projects. Ironically, the United States has the largest and most efficient capital markets in the world, but our renewable energy companies rarely have access to those markets. Extending MLP treatment to renewable energy could move the renewable energy industry from relying on a few investors demanding high rates of return to a broader and deeper investment pool for those energy projects. Continuing the MLP structure in the Internal Revenue Code and expanding it to include investments in renewables and clean energy would provide a predictable tax policy that encourages investment in U.S. energy projects, creates jobs, and promotes American competitiveness in the global race to develop and utilize competitively priced energy sources. I grew up in a family whose uh, father worked in the oil fields. It's what put, put food on our family's table. The energy sector is a perfect example of how uh, America can provide a uh, uh, an opportunity for all Americans to pursue the American dream, uh, and I encourage the committee's consideration of uh, MLPs, and I thank the chairman. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, welcome your testimony. I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of the bill. I think you and Senator Coons have done a terrific job in putting this together. Uh, I'm wondering if you might just speak a little bit more about the kinds of energy companies you think that would uh, be most interested in organizing. You talked a little bit about it, but as you talk to businesses, uh, no, I, how do you think this would have a specific impact? What kind of businesses would be most interested in organizing with MLP? Madam Chairman, uh, it uh, is clear to me that certainly the uh, tax treatment available or the, the, uh, the, the circumstances that our uh, oil and natural gas companies, our pipelines, our infrastructure companies in the energy sector are able to access today is very important to them. And so in part, I'm here to indicate that that needs to continue. But as you say, there are a number of other companies, uh, num another, a number of other companies involved in other sectors of energy, wind, geothermal. The opportunity to, to uh, raise capital is one of the greatest impediments toward us pursuing more energy projects in the United States. Senator Cornyn talked about Texas. Uh, Madam Chairman, I would, I, I would only disagree with you when you indicate that all those things can be done in Michigan. Uh, they can and are being done in Kansas. Uh, the manufacturing of, um, of the, the necessary equipment to, uh, to create wind and solar is occurring in our state. Uh, we are the third uh, largest supplier of wind energy in the country. Hmm. Uh, the ability to transport that uh, energy elsewhere where wind is not such a viable resource uh, creates the opportunity to, to the, the necessity of raising significant amounts of capital to transport, to transmit that energy. Again, these are areas in which private investment, not only in the production of energy, but in the transmission of energy in the renewable area, uh, that I believe uh, this legislation, this tax provision, creates great opportunities. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee? Senator Cornyn? I have some really hard questions for Senator Moran, but I'm going to withhold them for now. You can put them in the record. Where yeah, we can, I'll put them in the record. That's right. <laughs> I'll avoid yes. you. Senator this. Bennett. I, I, not a question, but a comment. I just want to say thank you to you and to Senator Coons for your leadership on this uh, important bill. We are about, as Senator Cornyn said, we're about to begin this discussion about tax reform generally in the country. And what I hope people will remember when they hear people say the government shouldn't pick winners and losers. Uh, is that we already have a tax code that's full of that, full of decisions that have been made about winners and losers. And what we need is a tax code that's actually looking forward into the 21st century, into the economy that the people of Kansas are building and the people of Colorado are building that doesn't necessarily look like the economy from 100 years ago. So I want to say thank you to you for recognizing that and, and for the work you've done on this bill. Thank you, Senator Bennett. Thank you very much. We appreciate your coming. Madam Chairman, thank you. I did submit a letter to the committee, uh, and I'm interested in uh, further pursuing the witness protection uh, program that it does. Uh, <laughs> and we look forward to working with you on that as well. <laughs>